Good afternoon. I'm Leanne Panduran. I'm the CEO of Rowe Professional Services Company. And on behalf of all of us here at Rowe, we want to welcome you today to our office here in downtown Flint. Rowe has been part of the business community in Genesee County since 1962. We opened our first downtown Flint office in the mid-90s. We were very fortunate to be part of the downtown redevelopment that allowed us to move our corporate headquarters into this building in 2009. For over 20 years, we have been working with the City of Flint as a partner on many infrastructure projects, as well as working with many of the surrounding communities. Because of this, we are part of the community and we have a personal and professional interest in this issue. And we stand ready to be part of the team that is offering technical advice and engineering leadership to address these issues. Excuse me. As we move forward, um, we look to our team to make this happen. And we need to have the entire team working together. I don't think anyone in this room will dispute the fact that there is no easy fix, there is no simple solution. But in working together, we can address the needs not only of the community, but the residents, as well as our own staff who live and work here in that community. So with that, it's my privilege today to welcome and introduce the Honorable Rick Snyder, Governor of the State of Michigan. Well, thank you, Leanne, and thanks for hosting us here today. It's great to be with my partner, the Lieutenant Governor. Um, great to have Director Cray here and the experts from Roe. So I appreciate the opportunity to share an update with you on, because this is an ongoing process. Um, we've done a number of things, but there's much more to be done. And this is another step forward in that, announcing that this infrastructure study will be taking place. Um, the ultimate goal here needs to be um, replacing the lead service lines. And I believe we're in common goals with the mayor to get that done. Um, there's a number of steps to do that the appropriate way. And one of those steps is to get an infrastructure study done. Again, we need to understand where the lead service lines are, um, what the nature of the project is to take them out and have them replaced. And that's where it's important to have outside expertise. And Roe is a longstanding member of this community with great engineering expertise. Uh, they've worked in this community on water-related issues for a long time. And so I think it's great to have them on the team. Um, in terms of coming up with this agreement, we worked in partnership with the city um, and actually had them also review this agreement to make sure it was in accordance with what they perceived as what was important. So there's a series of steps that will be part of this infrastructure study. Um, there'll be an update of a reliability study that was done in 2013, I believe, um, that we need to do as part of this process. Um, there'll actually be 30 service lines replaced in terms of looking at the proper procedures to do that kind of work and how to do that most effectively. And then there'll be a lot of work done in terms of mapping out the balance of the system because we think there's approximately 10,000 service lines. We don't know their composition. Um, that are connected to active residences, and we want to find out that information as best as possible to allow us to do the most effective work there. So this is an important step. Uh, their timeline's roughly a month to do this over the next month, and then to do a long-term asset plan over the next three months. That will give us good information to work on. So we want to do this in partnership with the city. We want to keep moving forward, and again, work on this goal of ultimately replacing the lead service lines. In the interim, um, I'm sure you'll probably have questions. We're continuing to do work on the Sentinel test sites, again, to check for water quality going on throughout the city. Uh, we're continuing to monitor test results that residents are submitting and continuing with bottled water and filters. So in the short term, we're continuing many of the steps we've talked about in the past. If you want to ask questions about that, I'm always open to that. Um, but this is a step forward to that next stage of the plan to say, let's understand the system, let's understand the pipes, and let's look forward to a system of how to get them appropriately replaced in a safe fashion, really prioritizing the most dangerous first, and then doing it in a safe, effective way. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to the, our director of the DEQ, Keith Craig. Keith. Thanks, Governor. And I'll be fairly brief today. So as you know, we do have a number of um, sampling processes and protocols out there. There's a five-point plan, and we've talked about that in the past. So we have individuals that are sending in water samples. We have over 10,000 samples that have been sent in. So I really want to thank the, the residents of the community of Flint to uh, help us determine what is, uh, what is the quality and in, in the safety of the water at this point in time. Number two is we are working with the schools. And so the schools should be replumbed by the 1st of March. 
And so then we'll do some deep flushing, and I appreciate the superintendent and our relationship that we've determined or that we've developed with the uh, superintendent. Three is we are working with the business community to make sure that, especially on the food side, to make sure that they're meeting best practices. Four is we are continuing our um, collaboration, if you will, with the Department of Health and Human Services and some of the local uh, medical practitioners to, relative to the lead uh, high blood level testing. And then lastly, as the governor says, we're, uh, we have Sentinel sites up and running. Uh, we did visit 402 sites. Some of those individuals dropped off, so we're going back and redoubling our efforts to make sure we get to 402 sen uh, Sentinel sites. Within that uh, 402 sites, though, there was, uh, there was at least the initial identification of some of those sites having lead service lines. And that's where the governor mentioned, we're having difficulties finding lead service lines in Flint and actually determining that. And so anything that residents can do, uh, we'd appreciate. And that's what we appreciate with role bringing to the table. They have some history in the community. And so that with that knowledge and history, they can help also through some of our knowledge. The other thing is I need to thank the uh, plumbers and the plumbers union. Uh, they're out with our Sentinel teams. And they're actually helping with the plumbings with inside the, the homes that have had high uh, levels. And so by doing that, we can determine does it have a lead service line coming in, but that's only at the meter. And so there's a lot of unknowns in that system, and we need to truth that system. So we'll look forward to doing that. And with that, Governor. Thank you, Keith. I'll open up for questions. Rob? Yeah, Governor, you have said as, as, as recently as last week that you're still looking at the possibility of coding lead yeah. pipes as opposed to replacing the Flint mayor today came out with a release saying that she wants complete replacement and she wants it started right now, immediately. And so I have two questions. One, are you still on the fence in terms of coding versus replacement? And then politically, where is this going when she starts invoking the name of Ruth Romero and other people in this and, and putting politics into the, the mix here? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say, Rod, is they're not mutually exclusive. Um, that's one of the things I'm happy to clarify. If you perceived it that way, other people could. It's not a versus. Um, you can do both, and you should do both. Again, this is actually, if you go back to some of the comments from Professor Edwards, um, if you look at the history here and you have situations like this, the best step is, is you reestablish the coding, and you do extensive testing to say, is the water safe based on coatings? Um, that way you can potentially get the water coming out of the tap available to people again. Um, the second step is, is to do this infrastructure study. And this is the second step to know what you're dealing with in terms of underground infrastructure and how best to approach it. The third step is this replacement of pipes. Um, so they're not mutually exclusive. They actually follow a time sequence that you have a shorter term activity to get the water back on through the taps you can do with coating in terms of the technical thing. We may have a confidence issue with the community and I acknowledge that. But again, experts have told us that is possible and we're doing the scientific testing with these 400 sites to say, is that taking place? So when she, when she says that she wants to start replacing pipes next week, are you on board with that? Well, again, that's when you mean next week. Uh, that, I do have some concerns about how fast you do it, but that's part of this process to say there's gonna be 30 samples in terms of pipe replacement as part of this project. So some of that could start fairly quickly. Um, I don't know if I'd want to say next week or not, but we're talking a very short timeline to start having some pipes replaced in the community in terms of looking at that and the best way to do it. We're going to back door, Ryan. I'll go there. To your defense, a lot of people make saying critics that it's about time we had this kind of movement. But in your defense, just to be fair and honest, I think you're basically saying this is not a time to make mistakes, and I've got to make sure that I cross every T and dot every dot. No, I appreciate that. I think I've been consistent in this message, and I, hopefully that's resonated to say you coat the pipes, you do the infrastructure study, and then you do pipe replacement. And again, I'm going to the person that I trust their judgment a lot is Professor Edwards. If you look at his testimony for Congress, I believe that's what he said. So if you put that in context, this is a process we just need to follow through on and stay consistent. So I appreciate that. I, so I would reinforce this message. And again, I don't think it's inconsistent with what the mayor's saying. Again, people may have differences in timelines, but her goal is to get pipes replaced. Well, that's one of my goals, but that's one of the steps of this larger process. Ms. Um, 
Governor, there was a study similar type thing done. I don't yeah. know if it's it, based on some of the things you said. It makes me yeah. think it is in partnership with U of M Flint. Dr. Kaufman there did a study, and I sat down with him as he was in the process of it. Are you using the information that he gathered because he did go through a lot of old files from the city? Yeah, that's something we're looking at. Again, that's been more recently identified to us. So actually, I'm following up on that this afternoon. So we're doing some work talk trying to con contact the professor, the doctor, to say how can we leverage his work? Because again, if he's done good work, and I have no reason to believe he didn't, let's try to put that in the equation to use that. And to go to the last question, the other thing I'd emphasize that you might want to check the background on is, in DC, they actually did cases where they created additional damage um, because they started taking out pipes too quickly without doing the proper procedures and everything else, and so there's some real concern that you want to do it thoughtfully from an engineering and scientifically sound basis. Jessica? Governor, there seems to be a little bit of, at least publicly, a disjointed effort, especially coming from the mayor's office. Can you clue us into what's going on maybe behind the scenes? Is it different than what the mayor's office is portraying? Well, what I'd say is, is people are all working with urgency. And so you have people all working hard. And it's always a challenge to stay in sync on all these matters. So we want to work as closely as possible. Because the common goal here should be how to get you know, this issue addressed to help the citizens of Flint, both in terms of water supply, um, medical care, educational support, and then long-term economic development. So again, this is the case uh, as you get to know new people. We have people in new roles here all working together. And in a crisis situation, uh, I think we'll hopefully see continued ways to work together. Um, I, I'll ask the experts on that one, but as part of reliability and then asset management, you would hope that would be some of the analysis to say what's appropriate for the size of the city. Uh, my name is Jim Redding. I'm with Roll Professional Services Company. And um, to answer your question, yes, the reliability study is really gauged at looking at the community's water system currently. Uh, regulations require that those studies are updated every five years, so it's about almost five years, but in light of the other situations that are going on, it makes sense to kind of revisit all that now uh, so that any improvements that are made to the system are consistent with the city's needs. So things like storage and size of pipes and all that will be reevaluated based on current conditions. Yeah, the, the other thing I'd add, just to... Uh, I'm not going to add to the technical side, but one thing I think you might find interesting if you didn't happen to see it is when we did our Flint Water Interagency um, Coordinating Council meeting last week, we actually had a presentation from the Netherlands, um, which was really interesting. Um, again, we had people trying to help from all over the world, and they had an expert from the Amsterdam water system come in and actually show how they went through their comprehensive asset mapping. and fundamentally made huge improvements in the reliability and how their system worked, and that's available on the web. So we're hearing anywhere from maybe 10,000 to 25,000 of these pipes across the city haven't been, it hasn't been determined whether there's lead in them. How long does it take to figure that out, and how are you doing it? I'll turn that over to Keith. With some difficulty, I'll, I'll be real honest. So with some difficulty, but what we're doing is we're actually talking to the plumbers. We're talking to people who have history in the community. We have people who have been working in the homes. And so through that knowledge, and then you can go in and do the easy analysis. Does your magnet stick to the pipe, yes or no? Can you scratch it with a key, yes or no? And so there's some easy analytics you can do, but that only looks at that small portion of the pipe. The other way that you do it is either through sequential testing so you can take very specific testing and you can then profile that pipe and you can determine if it ha is, uh, has some lead in that pipe. So there's a number of ways to do that and we'll use all those ways and integrate that data to come up with uh, that composition. So how long should we expect that to take? Well, um, we're asking actually our friends here at Road to do that within about 30 days. And so we're, we want to make sure that we have some urgency but we want to make sure we're accurate. And so um, as we're looking at the map data, and we have a lot of maps, and you go on the website and find that, uh, you'll see where there's, they're looking at things like construction of homes. So they're looking at roof lines. And if this one has a lead service line, this one may have a lead service line. And then let's look at what's the work done in the house. And so we're using both a little bit of, quote, street knowledge, professional knowledge, and then computer knowledge. You're a job. 
Well, it will take some time, but I wouldn't want to speculate on that because it will take some efforts when you're talking thousands of pipes. And again, we don't even know that number. But the, the point is, is we don't need to wait um, for the whole project. We can start prioritizing. What are the highest risk pipes and how to do that in some thoughtful fashion? So I think we can work through that process um, in terms of the, the whole nature of this. And the first part was, I'm sorry. Yeah, the homeowners. That's one of the issues that we're looking at. Right now we're assuming we'll do more from the street all the way to the meter in terms of that. That's what they did in Lansing, I believe, in terms of, because you actually can create more issues if you start mixing. Um, and that's one of the challenge points we have now is we may have cases where the, the city may have, the utility may have already replaced part of that service line, but it still has another part. And so to go to Keith's point and Jim's point, that's part of the challenge here is when you look at one end or the other, that may not even tell you the answer um, unless you have good records. So would the state be willing to pay for those determined to be Well, again, what we're talking about is supporting the city in their efforts to do this, to be technically correct, because the utility needs should be doing this work, and we're going to provide resources to help support that. Well, for me, um, I know you're talking about flutes, but yeah. do you see this lead lines as more of a national problem. Now, have you looked at Detroit at all? I mean, are we going to go through this again soon, or are there levels in Detroit for them? Yeah, this is a huge national problem, Charlie, to be blunt about it. Uh, it's a challenge in a number of Michigan cities. And that's one of the reasons I started the 21st Century Infrastructure Committee, Commission, to actually look at the rest of the state. Because as we learn lessons from Flint, we need to be applying this knowledge base to say what are the right answers for the rest of the state. Um, that's one of the reasons I actually was, I wanted to testify in the Congressional Committee. Um, I want to have a chance, to, an opportunity to talk about the federal lead and copper rule. Um, that rule needs to fundamentally change. It's not right. It's not protecting our citizens the way it should. And then how it's being applied, again, going back to the question of bureaucrats, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. I'm not going to spend the rest of this session talking about that, but I can tell you, stay tuned. I have more, I'm going to have more to say on this topic. That There's a lot more important things that we should be talking about on this topic, both statewide and nationally. Have there not been a couple of rules like this stuff happen before? Well, again, go look at the testimony of Professor Edwards. Again, I want to give you a third party you can go. Go listen to what he said in the congressional hearing he already testified at. I think it's very clear. Huh? Um, in terms of knowing it was a problem identified by the state, by the DEQ, it was actually October 1st. In terms of saying that, we're, that there was testing and work being done on lead and that there were third parties bringing it up, it was during the summertime. But in terms of actually getting confirmation from our experts that there was a problem, the DEQ was essentially, I believe, October 1st or so or September 29th or 30th, and then the DHHS confirmed, I believe, October 2nd that there was an issue with the blood lead levels through Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha's work. As far back, Frank? Uh, Governor, uh, you appeared here in Flint back in October mm -hmm. to acknowledge there's a problem. Why is it taking five months to get to this point where we're actually studying this? What, why didn't we start this study back in October when we were the problem? Yeah, well, well, I believe we did start working the problem. There was more to be done, though. And that's a fair question to ask. Um, but as soon as it was identified to me, we started offering filters to people. We recommended flushing. We started doing additional medical procedures. Um, we transitioned back to the DWSD. Um, but there was more to be done, and that's the point. We've continued to add resources to do more over time uh, to, again, reconcile the issues, deal with the damage that's been done, and move forward. And I encourage everyone to be part of the solution. So just to be clear, that this study couldn't have been done in October, the, the resources 
Um, again, that was a question of needing to find the, the resources through the budget to do that. We got that in the supplemental. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Governor, uh, it, it looks like there could be a No, it's their cruise, and it should be their cruise, Jim. If you put it in the context, it's the city utility. In terms of the financial resources and to help pay for that, that's where I think they're looking to the federal and state government to help supplement and pay for what they're doing. Um, what I would also hope is that people are going to do it in a thoughtful way. Again, I have no reason to believe they won't, but let's be thoughtful about this because additional damage has been done in communities where it was just taking out pipes. So that's where I want to be clear, my ultimate goal is to get these pipes replaced also. Um, let's work together on the steps and stages to do that most effectively. And just one follow up on a related note, uh, the city of Flint uh, chief financial officer testified before the Lansing House Appropriations Committee that Flint could run out of cash by the end of this year with the $30 million that is going through the legislative process right now. It's a step in the right direction of a long journey. But one in six uh, Flint residents are not paying their water bills. They are in arrears, and they're also staring down the distinct uh, possibility of declining property values. So that, what's your concern or fear when you hear that Flint might run out of cash by the end of this year? Well, again, it's always a concern. We just got out of emergency manager staff some time ago, and I don't want to see them go back into that. I want the city of Flint to be successful, particularly given this crisis. I mean, that's a huge interest that I have. Um, as a practical matter, the $30 million credit was geared to say, how do we take care of 65% of the water portion of a water and sewer bill going clear back to April 14 until the time the water is going to get turned back on? And again, we made an assumption there, but that $30 million hopefully will provide a lot of resources in the interim, um, assuming it gets approved and the House is going through that process to provide some additional support to the city because that would actually be paid to the city to help make up for those non-payments. So one step at a time, but I think the $30 million is a very positive step to address both the concern of the citizens, and I appreciate their concern. They, that takes care of the issue. They wouldn't be paying for water they didn't use or they didn't see value in it, and then helping the city with their financial issue, at least in the shorter term. We're in the home stretch, guys. We're in our time. Uh, Ryan? Yes, Governor, uh, two questions, yes. and this is sort of piggyback on something you just said. Water they can use. Most recently, CNN just did a study. This is the highest water rates customers pay in the country. Not to put you on the spot, if you lived here, how annoying would that be even for you to know that you're paying the highest rate for water that you can't use? Well, again, this has been an issue in Flint long before emergency managers and long before this crisis. So that's a fair question that I hope people look at as they look at the KWA and everything else. And that was one of the concerns that came from the community. The community was the ones that promoting the concern about wanting to move away from DWSD and the high water rates. So again, that's a continuing dialogue that, again, I hope the mayor has that on her agenda as something to really address. You talked about the success and then yet some of the failures mm -hmm. and mistakes that we in Washington, D.C. We can talk about the legal and but right there, where you're at, at Capitol Hill, Lansing has had success. And I guess it's a question for Craig as well. Is it a procedure that they're using that you enjoy or perhaps are happy that it's been successful because they're doing it in half the time that they started back in 2014? I'm not sure I thought. I'm talking about the when they move the copper lines out, yeah. they take the lead lines yeah. out and they move the copper in. Sure. Is that a procedure that you're pleased with because they're doing it in half the time in which they started in 2014? Yeah, actually, I haven't spent a lot of time on that, but I do appreciate the city of Lansing coming to help. Um, you know, they've done good work in Lansing from all reports I've had about doing this in a systematic way to replace those lines, and they have found some cost-efficient ways, as you were mentioning, um, to the degree that will be tested here. I think that's a great thing, and I hope it works. Um, and I thank the city of Lansing for the mayor and their team for sending some resources to help out. I mean, do you know the procedure, correct? And for a reference to what they're doing and, and, and choose the procedure that you're pleased with it from a technical standpoint? So, a direct question is, is yes, our technical staff have been working with the Lansing Board of Water and Light to see, A, how did you identify the lead service lines? And that can help. What are the best practices and what are the technologies? 
And my understanding is, uh, in my conversations with uh, retired Brigadier General Mike McDaniels, that they're going to bring that into Flint. And that's a great proof of concept. So we look forward to that. Last one, short one. Jessica? In the meantime, some of these tests are coming in astronomical for lead to the point where the filters aren't even certified to work. In the meantime, has the, has the stance changed as far as people should be using these filters or not? I mean, there's 150 right now homes where the filters aren't working. I don't know if the stance has changed from the state. Yeah, we've actually, the EPA has sent teams into those homes in particular to follow up on them. There was one home that had a very high test result we just learned of. But we're on top of those in terms of follow-up. But in the, the particular home, there's a home that had a very high reading, um, I think was recently in the press. Um, the test took place on the 9th. Um, the results came back on the afternoon of the 11th. Um, a team was there the morning of the 12th um, and that did extensive work. This one of these teams, including a plumber, other people going in to do work on the community and to do follow-up. And we had a team revisit that home today. So this is the kind of action we want to see happen in terms of prompt turnaround uh, to deal with these kind of questions. So Keith can add, but I think we're working on 48-hour turns and everything else. Yeah, as, as the governor says, that's our top priority, and we're making sure we're in those homes. The only correction I would say is, remember, you take the sample with the filter off, the faucet. So it doesn't necessarily mean the filter failed. And so we have great confidence in those filters, and we really encourage people to use filters. And this is the time to make sure you use the filters. And even, if, even when there are line replacements, keep your filter in place until the construction season's done. Don't move away from filters. That's a very important point we'd like to stress with the uh, community of Flint is to make sure you're using filters. Thanks. All right,